we are live now and today what I'm going to be talking about is basically answering a question that we had um, on one of our posts this week uh, which was how much time did it take to get those results with with the dog um, it was one of the posts for Henry in particular this week um, <clears throat> so I want to talk a little bit about about that question um, that was one that uh, I, I commented back on her and said that's that's gonna be kind of a long it's gonna be kind of a long uh, comment if I actually go into details there because it's not if I just give you a number then that's gonna kind of be demoralizing to people out there who have spent that amount of time and not gotten those results so uh, a question that we get asked a lot is how much time do we spend with the board and train dogs or how much time does it take to get the results and uh, it's not really just about the time spent it's about the impact that the time you spent had and the things around that so I want to talk to talk about that a little bit so uh, how much time did it take is the question that people typically pose but I think what they're really thinking is how much time will it take with my dog how much time will it take with my dog to get those kind of results and uh, it depends <laughs> it depends on a lot of different things depends on your goals it depends on your um, how much time you do have to spend uh, it depends on how long these have these uh, have potentially been problems for your dog um, your dog's love language and if you've identified that um, it, it depends on a whole bunch of different things so I want to talk a little bit about some of those things um, right now so the the real question is what creates the change in behavior like, I think that's the deeper question that everybody has. What creates that deeper change in the behavior of my dog? Um, because how can we do in two or four weeks what the dog hasn't done in their entire life? And it's not that there was no shortage of effort or time spent, because if you've got a dog at home, you've probably spent countless hours and lots of effort trying to make change in their behavior, but you're, you're not making progress. So it's not the lack of effort or time being spent. It's, um, and, and to, to specifically answer uh, the, the question in terms of time with Henry, uh, at the time I think that video was posted, he had been with us for, uh, probably a day and a half yeah he was here for about a day and a half um, so let's say 36 hours now obviously we did not train him for 36 hours he was here for 36 hours we probably spent active training time closer to two hours with him so uh, I know that that brings up the question well, what's all the what's all the rest of the time what's what's happening then and that's very important it's very uh, simple in, in a lot of respects but that's very important so the active training time that we're spending with the dog while they're w with us for a board and train is gonna vary in in the amount of time and the intensity from when they first arrive to their halfway through the week to next week to the end of that week and that's going to also vary on the specific dog and the behaviors that we're working on. So a uh, lot of things to factor in here. Um, in the beginning, we're doing less active training with the dog because we're building relationship, right? We want to allow them to kind of acclimate to their new environment, uh, to us, to the other dogs around, the sounds, the kids, you know, all this stuff. Uh, so there are some dogs that they can just walk in the door and we can get started right right away with them those happy-go-lucky I they, their their demeanor doesn't really change no matter where they go they can um, they can be handled by uh, a friend or a co-worker and and they have no worries about that uh, so those dogs yeah we might start training with them like within the first hour that they arrive some dogs we spend multiple days building a relationship with them, taking it very slow, letting them know they can trust us, and like I said, acclimating to the new environment. So we're not, we're not like asking them, we're not asking them really to do anything in those first 
two or three days with, with some specific dogs. Uh, and that, that is very much influenced by, like I said, the type of behaviors and the depth of, of those issues that they might have. Like if we've got uh, severe anxiety or reactivity, things like that, uh, we're not going to just jump in and start asking the dog to sit and do place and lay down and do all this stuff. Like, w on what grounds are we asking them to do all these things? And they've probably never been asked or they've never been really followed through on if, if they were asked to do these things in the past. So this is all very new. Um, there is a level of stress, good stress, uh, with them being here no matter what, no matter who the dog is. So especially right there in the beginning, uh, most dogs, we're not just asking them to do stuff on that first day, you know, that first night when they come or even the first day of, of training. Uh, that's not going to be the first thing that we start with, but that'll increase over time. So maybe on day three or maybe at the beginning of week two, they're spending considerable, a considerable amount more time actively training. Um, or we're doing things that are far, far more challenging already in just a matter of days based on the dog's progress, based on the dog's demeanor, based on, the, again, um, a whole bunch of different things. So the, the path to get to the end result looks a lot different for, for a lot of different dogs. Uh, but it, also, when we think about making the most of our active training time, that is very key. Uh, because we could be, we, I could have in a week, uh, let's just use 10 hours as a nice even number. If I spent 10 hours in one day, I could spend 10 hours in one day really just going at it, like boot camp style. We're gonna just train for 10 hours today, but that dog is not gonna get out of that 10 hours nearly the amount that I wanted them to, or, or they could have, if I would have spread that out over more time and given them short bursts of, in, of new information uh, and let them process that in between. So small blocks of time are far more effective when we are training our dogs than doing longer spurts, especially when we are introducing new information. So when we think about how we learn, how humans learn, this applies to us too. We don't learn and absorb and uh, remember all of, all of the content like when we're in a four-hour lecture. Uh, <laughs> When we go to sleep, we process that information and that's when a lot of that stuff really penetrates. That's how we can use that information moving forward long term. But if we just sat in a lecture for 24 hours straight, like a huge percentage of that information is not even getting in the brain, right? It's just, it's bouncing off of us. Like we can't take all that in and absorb it in a, in a really short period of time. So the same thing goes for our dogs. A lot of times, and again, this, is, this, this goes into uh, a lot, all the stuff we've been talking about and reading our dog, because they're gonna tell us when they've had enough and when they can't process anymore. But for some dogs, like we might only be doing two or three minute training sessions, maybe five minute, maybe 15 minute. In the beginning, those are shorter than, than as we progress. We might be doing 30 or 40 minute training sessions later on, but for a lot of dogs, like that's always going to be too much for them, right? For the, for the Malinois, for the German Shepherds, for the um, herding dogs, the working dogs, like they'll work a lot longer very happily. They've got the drive, they've got the energy, they've got the intensity to do that. Um, they're just like, yeah, 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 give me more information. Let's do more stuff. They're with it, right? But most breeds, I don't say most breeds, many breeds, like they're, they're just not, that is not what they're all about, <laughs> right? So after even five, six, seven minutes of us giving them new information and asking them to do things and introducing uh, new concepts to them, like they're on mental overload. So if we just keep going, we're, we're spinning our wheels. Like we are grinding our tires down. We are, we're not making progress. We're just stressing the dogs out now. And then in turn, we're inevitably stressing ourselves out right? Because our dog's getting stressed and they're not performing the way we want them to. And ah, like nothing's going the way I want because we're trying to just do too much too fast. So small blocks of time, small blocks of time. And in between our dogs need some, what we call soak time. So they need to absorb process, defragment that information. So 
whatever the new information that we just gave them was, maybe that's just the idea that uh, what, what, how do we actually define sit? Like for some, for some dogs, uh, they, they don't necessarily, their butt doesn't always hit the ground when we ask them to sit. They kind of do this kind of thing where they sag, but they're still like, they're loaded, they're a loaded spring. They're ready to just jump up at, at any sound or movement. Like we ask them to sit and then, right? So maybe just the idea of teaching them that when I say sit, the expectation is your butt is on the ground. Like that's new information. So when I say new information, it could be really little or, or really big. But the more new information that we give our dogs, the more time they're going to need to process that. So in a general sense, we can, we can say uh, if, if we're going to spend 10 minutes giving our dog new information, we should probably give them three times that amount of time to process. So we should give them a half an hour where we're not actively training them, where they're, they're able to just rest and process that information. And then we can get them back out and then we see that's when the progress is made. Not, not necessarily like inside a training session a lot because their wheels are really turning inside of a, a particular training session. Their wheels are turning and they're trying to figure it out but they're not totally sure. So they might do what you're asking but they don't fully compute all that a lot of times when they first do that. It's after they get that soak time and then they come back out and then you ask them to do it and they're like, bam, yeah, I know, I know what you mean by sit. I know what this means. I, you know that new information you just gave me? Like, it's all making sense now. So boom, like that's when we usually see the results. It's when we get them uh, to start the next training session that we see the results from the previous training session. We don't typically see the results inside the same training session that we've introduced the new concept or information. So that soak time is really important. And that soak time is generally in the dog's crate without anything going on. Uh, so soak time does not mean, cool, we're just going to go inside and you're free to do whatever you want or to play or, or to do, uh, what you would normally be doing because if the dog's free in the house, they're probably still taking in information, right? They're, be it, they're just searching or they're sniffing stuff or they're playing with toys or they're engaging with humans. Like there's still a lot of information going in. Um, it may be more trivial information or just fun things. It's not, um, you know, the same things that we're teaching them inside of, of an active training session, but they're still taking stuff in. So it's not soak time. That's not time for them. Just like with us, if we left a, a, a long lecture and then we started watching YouTube videos and listening to podcasts and having conversations like in that, in those moments, our brain is not really absorbing and defragmenting and processing the information that we took in from our lecture. So we need some time to just meditate or sit quietly or sleep. We're times, a uh, time where our brain is not actively doing something. So that's, that's important. Um, and a, a lot of what happens here that makes our training sessions more impactful is the structure. The structure here, the fact that we, like the dog's understanding that we're in control. And when I say we're in control, I know uh, some of you are cringing, right? You might be cringing. <laughs> it, control, right? So uh, anytime that we use like pack terminology or hierarchy or alpha, Anytime we use that, those terminologies, I know a lot of people, um, they're just like, uh, because when we think of that in human context, the way we use that terminology when we talk about humans and how we interact with other humans, it's very different than the reality of how dogs or wolves interact with each other in a pack hierarchy where there is an alpha always, right? Uh, there's always a leader and a follower. So that's, that's the way that dogs think the dogs are either leading or they're following. So in a lot of households, a lot of the dysfunction comes from the dogs think that they are leading or they should be in charge. And why is nobody listening to my instructions? Why, when somebody tries to come in the door and I bark at them, do they not leave? <laughs> I'm in charge, like they should be following my rules. So that creates a lot of anxiety and stress that's unnecessary and unhealthy and uh, it, makes it very hard for our dogs to even conceptualize the idea of taking direction from us. Like they're giving the direction, we're not listening. So being in control 
is not a punitive thing. It is the idea of just very, as Caesar Milan says oftentimes, calm and assertive. Being calm and assertive and just showing the dogs that this is my domain. These are my things and we're going to follow my boundaries. And it, again, to talk about how that looks with dogs, if they were just wild dogs, feral dogs, or wolves in the wild, the, the alpha dog is never just randomly out of nowhere aggressing on the other dogs. Like when we use the terminology, when we talk about interacting with our dogs, us humans interacting with our dogs, some people jump to those, those kinds of uh, far-fetched uh, conclusions like that that's, that's what, what it means when we say uh, being alpha or, any, or anything even remotely close to that. But being alpha would never look like that in a true sense, right? The only time the alpha is going to be assertive toward one of their pack members is if it's absolutely necessary. That's it. Any other time, the alpha is probably the most calm of them all. Just, just relaxed in control, but, but relaxed. So in, in our environment that we have here, there is boundaries, there's structure, there's expectations for the dogs as soon as they get here. And some of that is just as simple as when we open up your crate door, you don't come bolting out and just go running and getting into treats and jumping all over things and peeing wherever you want, which is what some of, some of the dogs do at home, right? Maybe your dogs are doing in your home. So we put the leash on and we wait for them to calmly come out of the crate. We set that expectation right out of the gate. Same thing when we walk outside, like we've got a leash on and we just make sure they're not bolting out first. They're waiting for us to give them an invitation to, to exit the door. Those simple little things, that structure and control and showing them that I'm in charge. Like I am the fountain of all the things that you want. Like all the toys are coming from me. The food's coming from me. The water is being presented from me. Like all these things are coming from me, all this good stuff. And I'm building relationships through this as well as some other things that we're doing. But like the rules, like the rules are my rules and we're going to follow those rules. So just having that structure makes a huge, huge difference in the way that your dog sees the world. Either they're looking at the world through their eyes and making decisions on how they should be enforcing all the rules that pop into their head about how things should be handled. You shouldn't touch that thing. This is my toy. Don't touch that. This person shouldn't be coming in the room. I'm barking at them. All these things. But when they see their environment through the, the lens of what is my, what does Eric think? Like, what does my, my owner think is appropriate? Then that changes a lot of behaviors right there right there so the structure is very very important um, and another huge thing is consistency consistency so we, what we see most often is um, dog owners giving their dogs commands all the time repeatedly and huge percentage of those commands that are given the dog's not doing anything right so um, you know, Fluffy comes over, I say, sit. Fluffy's butt hits the ground, jumps right back up. Cool. It's playing. Oh, great. So she, yeah, she knows sit. Yeah, she knows. She's known sit since she was a puppy. Cool. But then we say sit 15 more times and she does it one more time. So like we're saying, we're, we're repeating these commands all the time without really any consistency in what the expectation is. And oftentimes we're, we're not uh, we're inadvertently we're praising and rewarding our dogs for uh, doing the opposite of what we wanted them to do. Like if we're if we're giving them verbal praise or if we're even reaching down and touching them with our hand, like that physical praise, when they're not sitting, then we're we're really telling them that's the right thing. That's what we want. We're reinforcing that. So it doesn't really work to be reinforcing. The behavior that we want and reinforcing the behavior that we don't want the consistency isn't there and, and our dogs are not our dogs are not going to learn what the actual expectation is if the consistency isn't there um they're, they're going to make associations they're going to identify patterns and if there is no pattern and they can't really make an association to one thing to to the other there's no real connection or consistency there then we're going to get inconsistent behaviors out of our dog 
very consistently. <laughs> um, so consistency is absolutely, absolutely key. Clarity is also very key. So, um, you know, we talk a lot about body language, um, love languages, like those two things create clarity with our dogs. So when, when we are speaking to our dogs, we want our body language to be communicating the same thing that our verbal language is communicating. That creates clarity for our dogs because in the beginning, our dogs don't necessarily know what these words mean. They don't know what the word's expectation is or how to get what they want, be it physical praise, verbal praise, food, toys, whatever. They don't know how to get what they want when you ask them to do something. If there's not, uh, if we haven't had the consistency to show them exactly what that looks like. So using our body language in correlation with our verbal makes things very, very clear. Uh, for example, standing up like this versus bending down to our dogs, that's either being a more assertive, confident uh, posture as we are asking our dogs to do something or if we're doing a play bow and we're saying play with our bodies, but we're telling them to sit or we're telling them to lay down or to stop barking or whatever, like we're, like we're sending a very mixed signal to them if all the times we've said that word, we haven't been really consistent and our dogs are just inherently going to follow our body language, excuse me, before our verbal. So clarity is huge. Um, something else that we do that I wouldn't consider like active training that really makes the training easier and less stressful for everybody is we do some just general calming exercises and uh, some calming protocols here. So I'm not gonna get super deep into to what those are, but we do um, like conditioned relaxation, name and explain. Um, we basically free shape calm behaviors, um, and we particularly do this a lot more with uh, really anxious or nervous dogs. Um, and this is gonna build trust also, which is just another thing uh, when, when the dogs know what to expect from us and they trust us and we've been doing these things to make them calmer in not only their current environment, but future environments, any environment, then they're going to be a lot more willing and likely to quickly look to us for direction and willingly do that, whatever we ask them to do. So like all of these things work together to make that small amount of active training time we're spending with our dogs way more impactful, way more impactful. Um, because like I said, there, there's no shortage of time or effort being spent in every single pet fam, pet dog, pet dog's home, right? Like the owner, you are spending the time and the effort with your dog. So it's not the lack of time or effort. That is not the thing that changes the, the behaviors in our dog. It's the effectiveness of that time that we spend with them changing their behaviors, either adding new behaviors or taking old ones away or replacing them. So uh, all these things make a big impact so that when we've just got this structure set up, we're being clear with our body language, we're being consistent with everything that we do with our dogs, and we're communicating to them in a very clear way that says, I'm in control, I have everything that you need, and I am the fountain of all those things good, but we need to follow these guidelines and we're very clear, calm and assertive about those things. Then when we are trying to teach our dogs new ideas, it happens way faster and easier and more reliably. And we can do in just a couple of hours what would have never been achieved without the structure, the clarity and the consistency. So, uh, we, we need to not only have a strategic plan, but a tactical plan when we are addressing our dogs' uh, behaviors. So strategic, meaning we just need to have a plan and a purpose to what we're doing. And tactical, meaning we need to be able to ad adapt. We need to be able to adapt and adjust for our dogs based on what they're telling us. Again, we talked about body language. Our body language means a lot to our dogs, and our dog's body language should mean a lot to us. So if they're telling us that, that they're ready for more and they want to keep going and they're super excited about what we're doing cool let's keep working let's keep doing whatever we're doing
But if our dog's looking stressed or like exhausted, like, cool, let's stop. Let's stop while we're ahead. And if what we're doing isn't working, if we're, if we're, if we need to change course, like read your dog's body language, they're going to tell you if you need to change course. So we need to be strategic and we need to be tactical because the, the route, the path that we take to get your dog from A to B is going to be different than the next dog's path to get from A to B, right? We may go this way, we may go this way, we may go this way. The end goal is oftentimes going to be very, very similar, but the path we take to get there is going to be very different based on our dog's personality, our dog's age, our dog's size, our dog's love language, our dog's depth of, of issues. Are these just surface level problems like, oh, they, they don't listen, they don't, they don't really follow instructions, or do I have a super, super fearful, anxious, and reactive dog that has issues that, they, that they've been uh, building habits around for years? So a lot of different things to factor in there. Um, so hopefully this was helpful. Uh, let me know if you have any questions about any of the stuff that I talked about today or anything in general. Uh, we're going to be getting on here next Thursday, uh, hopefully back to our regular time at 12. Um, homeschool stuff with the virus shutdown threw off our schedule today. Uh, doing webinars for our kindergarten and first graders <laughs> with their teachers and classmates. So uh, hopefully we'll be back at 12 o'clock next week. But um, let me know if you guys have any other questions. We'll happily answer them. And you guys have a good rest of your week and stay healthy.